Morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, morning service, and we'd like to welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I know that we will have a blessed time this morning. Uh, we'd like to welcome Judith back to our pulpit, and um, she will continue uh, the second part of the, the series on Joseph. And I'm, I know I'm looking forward to listening to that. Um, I'll just get one notice out of the way before I forget. Um, James asked me to read this. Um, next Saturday, the 12th of October, at 10 o'clock uh, till 1 p.m. in the church hall, there's a tabletop sale and uh, a coffee morning. Um, so volunteers are required so for making and serving coffee. Um, and if anybody can help, either see Jean Eccles or uh, Ian. Um, all items are required for the cake and bric a brac there at stores, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just share one verse uh, this morning, um, and it's taken from uh, Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 5. I will make rubber a, sta a stable for camels and the Ammonites for flocks and you will know that I am the Lord. The phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord is written over 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. And God's making a point um, with this repetition. He wants us to know him. In actual fact, God wants the whole world to know him and to, to know who he is. And he longs to have a relationship with us. Are you determined to know God today? Not just to hear about him, but or read about him, but to know him personally. Scripture tells us that God is love. God is the truth and he is peace. And when you get to know God, you experience his love, his joy and his peace. And his truth will live in your life. Naturally, when you want to get to know somebody, you spend time with them, in their presence and talk to them. And when you talk to God, he promises to listen to you. Do you know the Lord is your saviour? If you don't, it's not too late. And if you do know him, well done for making a wise decision. I pray that each one of you will know the Lord, and I know that he will bless you. Amen. Um, we're going to have the uh, choruses uh, with Les now.
join in our young people's prayer. Have we got anything that needs prayer? Little ones. Anything to thank God for this week? Nothing? I'm sure there is, Lord. <laughs> right, okay, let us pray. Loving God, we gather today as a church family to praise and to worship and to honour you. Thank you that we can fellowship with one another, and most importantly with you. Father God, we want to know you more intimately. We don't just want to have an intellectual understanding of you. We want to know you on a deep and personal level. Lord, you knew each of us completely before we were born, and you shaped us and destined us for a purpose. Give each one a clear vision of all you want to do in and through our lives. We pray that you would help us to worship you without any distractions in our hearts. You know our minds wander about the coming week, the present worries, the things to do list. May we put our thoughts away and focus on you. May your Holy Spirit come into our hearts, soul, mind, and strengthen us so that we can glorify you in our singing and listening to your word. Father, you spoke the world into existence. You speak new life into your children. Give us the grace to receive your word. We ask, Lord, that you would convict us of our sins so that we can receive your forgiveness freely. We pray for the young people of our fellowship. May they have eyes to see all the good you send them. Help their ears to hear only you and their feet to go in the way that you will show them. Help their hands to do all that is loving, kind and true. We know, Lord Jesus, it's hard in this world with all its distractions. But may each one fix their eyes on you always. Pray that they will make right choices that you can protect and guide them. Help us to love one another and to care for one another as you have taught us. Be with us now, Lord, as we continue our fellowship and draw close to each one here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we we'll join in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we're going to join in our first hymn, which is hymn number 564 Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creations. 564.
We'll continue uh, with uh, our fellowship now as we're able to bring our tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. Gracious God, we come in your presence once again to worship you, source of all, the word of truth, breath of life, one God, now and forever. Long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Thank you for the privilege of being able to bring each other in prayer. 
We thank you and praise you for answers to prayer, for God's ring, for coming home and recovering. We thank you that Brian's here this morning. We continue to pray for him and for Gareth. We pray for others who are going through difficult times. For Jennifer's family, we pray, Lord, that you will be a source of comfort and peace at this sad time. We bring before you our hopes, our fears, our joy and concerns. Faithful God, we pray for Christians throughout the world particularly those persecuted for their faith. Sometimes it's so difficult to comprehend the pain and the suffering that our brothers and sisters have to endure on a daily basis. We ask for your protection. Strengthen them to remain strong in their faith. Guard all individuals and organisations that seek to help them. Creator God, we pray for your world, for those countries that are torn apart by conflict, illness and hunger. We pray for refugees who continue to flee from crises throughout the world, particularly in the Middle East and in Ukraine. We pray for the people of Israel, where tensions continue to escalate between Hezbollah and Israel. Lord, we ask that you would open the eyes of these extremists to be able to recognise your immense love. And we pray for protection for those who give their valuable time and energy to serve the vulnerable. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Judith this morning as she brings your word. And Lord, prepare the grounds of our hearts so that we will indeed receive your word. And Lord, that it might be a blessing to us each one here this morning. So Father, we ask for your blessing for the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is 668. The world was in darkness, in sin and shame.
Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. And nice to see everybody again this morning, either here or uh, virtually, if you're watching us on the screen. Just add a little bit to Nazra's um, notice about the tabletop sale next week. If you've been having a good declutter and you're wondering what to do with all the junk, if you'd like to sell it next week, if you uh, purchase the table for £10, you can do that. So if you'd like to sell next week, as well as come and perhaps buy more clutter to replace the clutter you're getting rid of, uh, then see Ian uh, afterwards about uh, that. So for our reading this morning, we're going to turn to uh, the book of Genesis again to continue looking at the life of Joseph. And we're going to read together this morning Genesis chapter 39. If you remember, we left Joseph at the end of last week. He'd just been taken as a slave into Egypt. And that's where we're going to pick up the story again. So Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he had left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against the Lord? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought to us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warder. So the warder put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warder paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did.
No doubt we've all heard that Frank Sinatra song, My Way. He sings it, doesn't he, with great gusto and with great feeling and a tremendous sense of pride that at the end of the day he can say that whatever came his way, whatever the options, he did it his way. Well, that's a song that Joseph would not have sung. Because in today's readings we see that Joseph is quite determined to do things God's way. The chapter that we've skipped over from last week, chapter 38, is not about Joseph at all, but it tells an incident concerning his big brother Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar. And so the opening verses of chapter 39 do resume the story from the point that we left off last week. Joseph sold as a slave to Potiphar, the Egyptian official. And chapter 39 breaks into three main sections, each with a lesson to be learnt. And the first six verses are all about Joseph's character and testimonial. Joseph is in a tough situation. He's a slave in a foreign land where the culture, the language and the religion are all very strange to him. A slave had no rights and as far as Joseph knew he was stuck in that situation for the rest of his life. There was no retirement age in the slavery system. And it wouldn't be a surprise, would it, to see that Joseph had come to the conclusion that God didn't care about him, that God had abandoned him. But look what actually happened. Verse 2 contains that phrase that I mentioned last week as playing a key part in Joseph's life. The Lord was with Joseph. And not only was he with Joseph, but he caused Joseph to prosper. God made a difference in the situation. And despite all that had happened and, and all that was happening, Joseph was determined to do things God's way and to develop a godly character. And so already we can detect some change in Joseph. As he was growing up in Israel, he would have been brought up to know about God and to worship him because uh, in spite of all his failings, Jacob had a very real and sincere faith in God. And he'd met with God on several occasions. And he would have brought his family up in the fear and the nurture of the Lord, as we sometimes say. Now, I don't know if you noticed last week in chapter 37 that God doesn't get much of a mention. It doesn't seem to figure very prominently in Joseph's life and thinking at that point. But things have changed. And God is now very much a part of Joseph's life. Maybe it was the situation in which he found himself that had caused Joseph to take God more seriously. And sometimes that's true for us, isn't it? We have to be taken out of our normal situation, out of our everyday comforts, to really start to think about our family and friends and what they mean to us, especially if we're isolated from them, like Joseph was at this point. And it's only when something like that happens that we really do give God some serious thought and we begin to determine to do things his way instead of ours. And here we have Joseph doing just that, as I said, the first six verses record for us an amazing testimonial to the development of that godly character in Joseph. And it was a development. It didn't happen overnight. Because by the time Joseph was put in charge of Potiphar's household, he was about 28 years old. So that's some 11 years or so after he'd been sold as a slave. God was with Joseph. And God made a difference. And that's true for us as well. God is with us. You know, one of the names given to Jesus by the prophets was Emmanuel, wasn't it? And that means God with us. 
Jesus wants to live with us and to dwell with us and to give us that Christ-like or godly character which will take us through those tough situations and will make a difference both to ourselves and to the situation. God was with Joseph and Joseph prospered. And the fact that God was with Joseph and making a difference to his life was obvious to others as well. Because in verse 3, Potiphar recognises this. He recognised that Joseph was different. And that it was God who had made the difference. And as an Egyptian, the only way that he could have known about God was by Joseph sharing his faith. And so we can assume that such a relationship had been built up between slave and master that Joseph was able to talk freely to Potiphar about God. He was able to witness, because even though the situation in which he found himself was a tough one, it was also a favourable one for sharing about God. Remember that the next time you feel that your back is against the wall. It may be that that is also a great opportunity to talk about God and the difference he can make. So God blessed Joseph because of his faithfulness. A blessing which verse 5 tells us also spilt over onto Potiphar and his household. And Potiphar soon saw the benefits of having a man like Joseph around and he promoted him and he made him the top of his household management team. With Joseph in charge, says verse 6, Potiphar did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Joseph allowed God to make a difference, not just to his words, but to his whole life. Because of his desire to honour God, he was totally honest and completely trustworthy. He was organised and competent in the job that he did. He always did it to the best of his ability. And you know, real spirituality does have to do with things like honesty, reliability, trustworthiness. It's not merely singing chorus and hymns and, and having good feelings in meetings or going home from services feeling that we've been blessed. There is an ABC to building a godly character. And we see that in Joseph and God wants to see it in us as well. So what's the ABC? Well, A is for attitude. If we have a negative attitude towards what we're doing and towards the person or people who gave us the job, this will transfer itself to the job. It will not be done to the best of our ability. It will become a burden to us. It might even not get done at all. Many slaves probably did have an, a negative attitude to their job. And in a way, we can't blame them, can we? But they maybe just did just as much as they needed to, to, to keep out of trouble. But Joseph adopted a positive attitude. He wanted to honour God, and this was reflected in the way that he did his work. So the question is, what's our attitude towards the jobs that we have been given? Whether that's a proper job, as we might say, where we go out to work and earn money for doing it. Whether it's a job at home, a job at work, or whatever. If we seek to develop a positive attitude towards the job and towards the people who give us the jobs, then we will also honour God in what we do. And we'll improve the situation. And probably ourselves as well. So a right attitude is the first step to building a godly character. So the B stands for behaviour. Attitudes lead to actions, don't they? And if our attitude is positive, then so will our actions be. And that means that we should be able to cope with responsibility, taking the initiative, being courteous, showing respect. 
Potiphar knew that with Joseph in charge, the job would get done. It would get done properly, and it would get done whether or not Potiphar himself was there watching. Joseph was totally trustworthy. He didn't need anyone standing over him to make sure he did his job. Can the same be said about us? I wonder how you would reply to the question, who, who do you or did you work for? Well, you might reply, well, the NHS or B&Q or Boundary Mill or Lancashire County Council, Court Travel. We'd get all sorts of answers, wouldn't we, from people in this congregation. And technically speaking, your answers would be correct. Those were the groups or organisations that you worked for or you still work for. But as Christians, there should be another answer, at least in our minds, even if we don't say it out loud. And that's, I'm working for God. Read Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24 when you get home. And you'll see what Paul had to say about it. Now, you may not be a slave, but if you substitute the word employee, student, church member, as appropriate, the outcome is always the same, that of Paul's words in verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So if someone had asked Joseph, who do you work for, Joseph? He might well have said Potiphar. But if he was asked, who do you ultimately seek to honour in your work? The reply would have been God. Make that your ultimate goal. And take those words from Colossians as your measuring stick for how well you are doing your job. And so C, in our alphabet, stands for character. Attitudes and behaviour develop character. It's a long-term, ongoing process. That's why we need to commit ourselves and our work to God day by day. Each day we need to say to God, Lord, you know what I'm going to be doing today? You know who I'm going to be working with? Help me to do the work and to deal with the people in the way that honours you. And having a boring or a, an unimportant job is no excuse for saying that we can't develop a godly character. Remember, Joseph was a slave. And even when he was head of the household, it would have been a pretty mundane, routine job. But he still did it in a way that honoured God and developed that godly character. I wonder if your boss or, or the people you work with day by day can say like Potiphar could about Joseph, there's something special about that person. God is with them. And we're not claiming that, that Joseph was perfect or that we will be perfect, but Joseph was and we can be different. People with integrity. And that counts for a lot. The next part of the chapter, verses 7 to 20, is all about overcoming powerful temptations. Another thing that we can learn from Joseph is that however long you've been a Christian, however strong your determination to go God's way, there will be times when you are faced with temptation. Your being a Christian doesn't make you immune to it. You know, even Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? But he knew how to deal with that temptation. And we need to learn the same. Joseph's biggest temptation comes right in the middle of this chapter, the incident with Potiphar's wife. See, verse 6 tell, tells us that this youth that we met last week is now well built and handsome. And Potiphar's wife soon takes a fancy to him and she wants to start an affair with him. But Joseph flatly refuses to entertain the idea. 
And we read earlier of the consequences of his refusal, which ended up with Joseph being thrown into prison, being accused of something he hadn't done. So how did Joseph handle this whole situation with uh, Mrs. Potiphar? Well, he clearly didn't let it go to his head when she began her attentions and she made her admiration obvious. And that shows us, doesn't it, that there's been a real growth in Joseph over the last 11 years or so. Because we can imagine that cocky 17-year-old of two chapters earlier being really flattered by this attention and perhaps getting big-headed over it and probably succumbing to it. But Joseph has matured. He's learned to accept himself for what he is with how God made him because he's learned his worth before God by walking close with God. And so when temptation came in the form of flattery to his physical looks, he handled it because of his spiritual strength. And we all need to learn to accept ourselves as we are and to concentrate on building that godly character well, that's not always easy, is it, in a society that puts so much emphasis on how we look and the lifestyle that we embrace. And the key verses in Joseph's handling of this situation are in verses 8 to 10. And Joseph refused Mrs. Potiphar for three reasons. First of all, he said, my relationship with Potiphar won't let me. He told her, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Joseph was not prepared to compromise the integrity that he had with Potiphar. Second, he said, my responsibility and the trust given to me won't let me. He was in charge of everything in the household except Potiphar's wife. He trusted him to get on with his work. And Joseph wasn't prepared to break that trust that Potiphar had placed in him. But third and most important, Joseph said, my relationship with God won't let me. Joseph recognized here sin for what it is, that primarily we sin against God. And so his response was, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He wouldn't even entertain the thought because he knew that thoughts lead to actions. We saw that last week, didn't we, with his brothers. Their thoughts of how they hated Joseph turned to the action of selling him as a slave. Now verse 10 tells us that Joseph had to handle the pressure of his, this temptation constantly. Every time he went into the house, Mrs. Potiphar was pestering him. And when you're faced with that same situation day after day, it does have a wearing effect and it is easy to give in. We know that. And Joseph didn't resist because he was some sort of superman with amazing powers of resistance or because he had no sexual awareness, or, but because he had that relationship with God. He was walking close to God. He was determined to go God's way. You know, that's the only way we're going to resist any temptation, be it sexual or whatever. To be in that close relationship with God, to have that determination to go his way. And Joseph not only refused to entertain the thought, but he did something else quite crucial as well. He refused to put himself in the way of that temptation physically. He wouldn't go near Mrs. Potiphar because he didn't want to put himself in the position where perhaps his emotions and his feelings would get the better of him. And when he did accidentally find himself alone in the house with her, what did he do? He ran for the door. He made a quick exit. And you know, there will be times in our lives when for the sake of our relationship with God and our integrity, we have to run for that door marked exit. 
And that's not denying the sovereignty of God and his protection in our lives. It's actually being sensible. It's being sensible. It's doing what Joseph did. Reasoning the situation out and taking the right action. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 is a good verse to know in times like this. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. When we're in tricky situations, God provides a way of escape. It's up to us to use it. So Joseph did the right thing in resisting a powerful temptation, but he still ended up being wrongly accused, thrown into jail and forgotten. So the last part of the chapter tells us about coping with tough situations. You know, there must have been times when Joseph asked himself, is it worth it? Is it worth being so honourable towards God when I end up in a situation like this? And there'll probably be times when we ask ourselves that same question. Is it worth it? And by God's grace, the answer is yes. We have far more to gain by going God's way than we have to lose by going the way of the world. In this situation, Joseph had two alternatives. He could run to God and ask for his help, or he could run away from God. And Joseph hung on to God and to his faith. And God held on to Joseph, as verse 21 tells us. How do we cope with tough situations? By learning the lesson of acceptance. Accept that in your Christian life you will face tough situations which you don't understand and for which you don't have the answers. But remember there is a big difference between fatalism and faith. Fatalism is the attitude which says, well accept it, you can't do anything about it. It's fate. But faith says, God is able to intervene in this situation and he is supreme. God does not make mistakes. So learning acceptance is learning to come to terms with God's power and authority. And again, Paul gives us a great summary of this attitude in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances, because I can do everything through him who gives me strength. There are times when you cannot change your circumstances, but you can change your attitude towards them with God's help. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered when he was a slave. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him kindness as a prisoner. The Lord was with Joseph and gave him success whilst he was in prison. In both Potiphar's household and in prison, Joseph was given full responsibility as he later would be for the whole of Egypt. But this was always by the blessing and the overruling of God and never by his own wits, which is what his father Jacob had often tried to do. What is success? Money? Career? Status? Popularity? Pleasing myself? For us as Christians, success in God's eyes is going God's way. Doing God's will, growing in Christ and being spiritually fruitful. And when the world suggests that you should go any other way, just ignore it. Frank Sinatra remarks in, I did it my way. I did it God's way is the song 
that he wants us to see. For his sake, for our sake, and for the sake of others. I did it God's way. Is that the song you're singing this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we look through the life of Joseph, we can see how he grew that godly character. And may he be an example to us to have the desire that whatever happens, whatever circumstances come our way, we will want to build that same godly character. We will want to follow you and we will want to say, I'm doing it your way. Strengthen us and bless us, we pray, in order that we might do that and help us to listen to your guidance. In this coming week, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we're going to sing together the hymn number 193, and I'm sure Joseph would agree with the first line of this hymn. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He must have often thought that, wasn't he, while he was in that prison. What on earth is going on? God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. 193.
you think of, wow, look at that. That's a grill, that, isn't it? And there's another good one. Oh, we've got an, oh, careful, I don't fall over. Let's look at your picture. Oh, that's great, isn't it? What's going on in these pictures? Can people remember? Let's look at our eyes. Yeah. Oh, he's got a pink baby mat and all that, aren't we? Oh, yes, an ash reel as well. So what's going on? Be with us all, evermore. 